Good morning, everyone. This is Janie Seltzer. I am the spiritual director for the Zig Ziglar Family Community International, and I'm broadcasting live here in Carlsbad, California, at the site of Hidden Life Ministries, where I'm also the spiritual director here, along with my pastor husband, Don Seltzer. I look forward to seeing you come on. If you can begin to give me a thumbs up, I hope everyone can hear me well. Uh, if you can't, please let me know. I think that the sound, there's Joseph. Hi, Joseph, how's the sound? Can you let me know? Give me a thumbs up if all is well. Good morning, good morning. I'm so glad to see all of you. Thank you for coming on. Uh, as I say each week, I don't want to talk to myself. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Hi, Judy. Oh, is that John? John is give, John Davidson telling me the sound is good. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. I say to you a happy Sunday morning. This is the day the Lord has made. I want you to say that. I'm going to say it slowly. I'd like for you to join me in your heart to... Thank you, Joseph. I see the sound is good. This is the day the Lord has made. Hmm. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That is, is every day, not just Sunday. In fact, you will find that your day goes a whole lot better if you deliberately quote that passage of scripture, reminding yourself, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Um, you know, it's a, it's a commitment. Thank you for the love. I love you too. Sending my love out to all of you around the world in this space where everyone is welcome. You don't have to agree. I say that also. You can listen. You can ponder. Please do. I invite you to. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning, Karen. Good to see all of you. And I also want you to know that if you have prayer needs, please feel free to post them because there are people listening who, oh, thank you, Mary. I'm glad you're rejoicing. Yes. Uh, there are people listening who will pray for you and I will pray for you as well, but we're a community. We're doing this together. And hi, Elizabeth. It is, it is, that's the whole point. We gather together in the presence of our living God, <laughs> who is my master, Jesus, Jesus, the Son of God, the Divine One, the Anointed One, whom Mr. Zig Ziglar followed and learned from and was energized by, which enabled him to become a success in every aspect of his life. But it all begins in here. As you know, my stick is nourish soul and live whole. Hello, Mia. Good to see you. So I'm going to, I would love to speak to all of you, and I will share. Mitchy, hi, good morning. Blessed Sunday to you, too. And um, that is Manuai. Uh, Manuai, I'm not sure I said that right. Good morning. Hello, Deborah Nelly, and thank you for sharing JamieSeltzer.com. Please come on to my website as well, and you can learn more about who I am and what I do. But I'm focused not on me, but on my Lord and Savior, Jesus. And those who listen to me are going to hear directly from the Word of God. I'm just his messenger, and I have to be faithful um, and speak with both grace and truth, as you know. And our question for today, as we continue in the parables, is would you like a seat at the table? Question. Would you, would you like a seat at the table? What table, you say? Well, the table of the kingdom of God. Would you like a seat there? That is, I, I, I don't say that glibly. I don't say that like a rhetorical question that, well, the obvious answer is, of course I do. Well, no, actually. Um, it's a deep question, and I don't want you just to automatically say, well, of course I do. Well, I mean, if that's how you feel, and it's deep, and it's real, then, ah, 
Let's get to the table. If you're still on the fence and you're still thinking, then keep thinking and keep pondering as we go into this parable of the kingdom. It's the kingdom invitation. I think we all like invitations, don't we? Yesterday, I went to a baby shower for a, um, a dear friend. In fact, she was our worship leader here at Hidden Life Ministries for a couple of years, and she and her husband are about to have twins. And yesterday, I got to go to a shower for my friend Chelsea, and it's it was a wonderful shower. And wow, yeah, twins, it's a big deal to have twins. I wonder how many of you out there have twins. Uh, it's a sobering thought. And uh, the theme of the shower was two peas in a pod, which I thought was really cute. We all like to be invited to go someplace where we can celebrate together with others. Don't we? Don't we like to be invited? Don't we want uh, to know that we're, um, that we are welcome? Don't you want to be welcome? Well, I, I think it's a question that is even bigger. It's a question, do you want to be welcome in the kingdom of God? Would you like to be welcomed in the kingdom of God? Would you like that? Would you really like that? And if so, what do you need to do to receive, to get to sit at the table of the kingdom? What will reserve your seat? This is a, a covered chair, like our, is often done at banquets and weddings, um, where it's it's covered, and then there's the the the. Um, the bow over the chair. That's what this is. If you can't tell what this is, it's a chair at a beautiful banquet. Um, a chair that I hope and pray that all of you will want to have pulled out for you and an opportunity to sit down at this great banquet feast. The invitation is to all if you will come. And I'd like to pray right now for the Holy Spirit of God to speak through me and to your heart so that you can be sure to have a seat in the banquet feast of eternity. Would you also, before I begin to pray, begin to like and share this video right now on your Facebook page so that others can hear how to secure a seat in the banquet feast of eternity. It's an important message, so important that I just, um, I, I'm just overwhelmed with it. And um, I, I, I had almost difficulty getting online because I was scrambling with, with great intensity and joy and hopefulness that many of you listening to me may for the first time say yes to receiving a seat in the banquet feast of eternity. So let's pray together. Holy Father, I come to you as your child, loving you with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Father, I pray for your mercy to flow through my words to my listeners. I pray, Father, that you would bring online, all over the world, all who need to hear this message and that what is said out of my mouth might go from my heart by the power of the Spirit into the hearts and the souls of those listening and that they would hear your invitation to come. Come to the great banquet feast in your holy, holy name, the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Thank you, my friends, for being with me, and I pray you'll stay with me as we explore this parable um, that Jesus talked about. And by the way, banquet feasts are, uh, are intricately woven in the history of the Tanakh as well as the New Testament. Um, there is so much to be said, and and in in the Tanakh, which is the Genesis through um, 
uh, Malachi all the way through the entire Tanakh, uh, what Christians or Gentiles call the Old Testament, but it's not old at all. It's the Tanakh of God. You see the invitation um, of Yahweh to his people to come to this great banquet feast. And so Jesus, Yeshua, in the New Testament, picked up this theme immediately. In fact, you may recall that his first miracle took place at a wedding feast. It's the miracle of the, the turning of water to wine at Cana of Galilee. I'm sure those of you who are familiar with the New Testament recall the story. Jesus and his disciples, uh, he had just was just beginning to gather his 12 disciples around him who would follow him faithfully and sometimes not so faithfully all the way to the cross. In fact, at the end, they all fled, but they came back. Well, at any rate, back to the point. He, Jesus and some of his disciples showed up at this wedding banquet, uh, this wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. And when they arrived, the all of the good wine had been um, already drunk. Um, it, it had everyone, there was no more wine. And this was a great dishonor um, if there was no wine for the guests. Now, um, the the master of the household went to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and said and told her, and she went to Jesus and asked Jesus to do something about it. Kind of a hilarious moment, if you can, if you think about it. Um, why, uh, why would Mary go to Jesus and ask him to do something about it unless she fully knew that he was fully capable of doing what he stepped in to do? But. There's mystery there. We don't know if she really knew that he, I mean, she knew that he was uh, the uh, conceived in her by an immaculate conception, uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. She knew that this was the promised Messiah of Israel, but there was a lot she didn't know. And I think it was sort of like a mother who went to her eldest son and just said, can you do something? Well, Jesus sure could do something. And he, um, he performed a miracle that is astonishing. There were big jugs of water and he asked them to be brought. At first he pushed away a little because he, he, he did not want to be seen as the magic man. Jesus was never about show. But he decided, uh, we can only think that he decided this was the time to initiate his ministry on earth because of the venue. The venue was this great feast, the wedding feast. And when he began to proclaim the kingdom of God has come here and now, what he was doing was he was calling his bride to his own wedding feast. Um, there's so much information in the um, concept of a wedding feast. And of course, we see it all the way down to, to the end of Revelation where we are invited into this great feast of the kingdom in the, that, at the end times. So, so Jesus initiated this first miracle in this venue because it, it really set the pace for his entire ministry. And he used the illustration of feasts, both wedding feasts and banquets throughout his teaching. There are several parables on feasts. And so we're going to touch on one of them today, and we're going to see how important it is that we say yes to the invitation. I want to remind you, poet that I am, here we go, Deborah Nelly, um, that um, we live on the 
brink of eternity, every single one of us. We all are just a breath away from eternity. I uh, was reminded of this just yesterday when I was having lunch with some friends, and one of my friends related that she was standing at the foot of her mother's bed when she saw her take her last breath. And she was describing it to us, and she said, I was standing there and I saw my mother simply go, and she was gone. And I knew instantly that she had died. Why? Her last breath. She breathed out her own soul into the presence of God. And it, it, even though we all know that this is what death is, that our soul leaves our bodies and in a breath, just a swoosh, it's, it's riveting to think that we are animated by this spirit within us, that our bodies are nothing without our spirit. Our spirit is everything. Jesus said, the flesh means nothing. It is the spirit that counts for everything. And my words are spirit and they are life. So friends, as I speak to you, I want to remind you that we are just a breath away from eternity. I have this poem called Here and There, and it goes like this. You may have heard me say it before. I don't recall. A fine veil lies between here and there. I strain my heart beyond the sky to see a good thing to remember. We totter on the edge of eternity. Close by, an angel, unaware. Prayer leaps from here to there, through space and time. Draw back the wispy curtain to see. We totter on the edge of eternity. I don't know. I think it's a gift. I have always, from the time I was a child, had a sense of tottering on the edge of eternity. And I consider it a, a gift that I have felt that. It can be scary, but that scary, that fear of how close we are to leaving our own bodies draws us deeply into the heart of God, into finding God. Let's just start there. Who am I? Where did I come from? And where am I going? The essential questions of life. And I, I pray that the veil that covers your mind and your eyes from a sense of reality would be lifted right now, even as I speak. For you totter on the edge of eternity. And every word that Jesus spoke to us was full of truth that we need to know. This is need to know info. I went to a conference once and I loved that. They said, okay, first we're going to give you the need to know info. And I'm like, oh yeah, well, I'll tell you some real need to know info. And here it comes. We totter on the edge of eternity. So my friends, I want you to listen deeply to this, to this parable of a banquet feast that Jesus told. Now the context here is he was sitting at the table, at the banquet table of a Pharisee. And these were very well-to-do men, very highly educated men. They were the leaders of Israel. And Jesus spoke these words to these men. Here they go. I think you'll be able to read them, and hopefully I will too. Yes, Jesus replied with this story. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. But they all began making excuses. One said, I have just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, 
I now have a wife, so I can't come. <laughs> that one was, just can't come. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, there's still room for more. So his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge everyone, excuse me, the word is, urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. Whoa, hmm, so much information here, right? So much. Um, we hear this great banquet. Now remember, keep the context in mind. Jesus is looking right into the eyes of these well-to-do, highly educated, and religious Jewish leaders and telling them this story. It no Nothing was lost to them about the meaning of this story. They understood the banquet feast to be an image of the kingdom of God. And because, you know, it's going to be a place of fellowship. Where do we fellowship more than sitting at a great feast? What joy, right? What joy. And so they knew, they knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. And they're listening deeply, as I hope you are. They're seeing, first of all, that there are three, well, all the, well, first, many invitations were sent out, right? And the, the, by the way, the invitations were sent out in advance of the feast. This is not like at the last minute. This is a very big deal. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the movie. It's rather slow moving, but it's full of great beauty. It's called Babette's Feast. If you've never seen it, it's a, it's a classic. It's an old movie, but I encourage you to find a copy of it and to watch it, Babette's Feast. It's, it's, it's a parable, a movie parable of inv being invited to the kingdom of God. It's, it's a remarkable movie. Um, so anyway, this, the invitations were sent out as in the movie. The invitations sent out, people are excited. There's going to be a great feast. And so they know that they've been honored to be invited. Yes, they have been honored to be invited. And they make preparations to be there. How many of you have been invited to a beautiful wedding and you just, eh, don't really want to go? I mean, maybe some of you feel that way, but most people look forward or uh, 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 talk about a banquet feast with the leaders of a country and you want, you've been honored to be invited. So, this was a big deal. And the master of the house went about preparing with all of his uh, servants, all of his people who work in his household have been preparing the food, preparing this glorious table, uh, setting up the chairs, making beautiful arrangements of flowers. I have, uh, there are many pictures that could be presented here. Um, making this feast um, a great privilege to be a part of. And so when the feast was ready, um, the, the master of the house sent out his servant to go and announce that the feast was ready. Come and eat. And Jesus told the, the Pharisees that there were three people who responded in three very interesting ways. One of them said, essentially, um, I just bought a field and I must inspect it. Please excuse me. Now, the man was courteous, right? Um, and what has he just done? He, he's got business going on. He just bought something and he's got to attend to his business. That's his priority, his business. And so 
please excuse me, he says cordially. The second one said, I just bought five yoke of oxen and I've got to, I've got to get them uh, going and, and uh, try them out. It's sort of like, well, I just bought a Ferrari and I need to go give it a whirl around in the countryside or through the city. And um, that was more interesting than going to the banquet feast. So he said, please excuse me. And then the third man said, well, I've got a wife now. <laughs> now, okay, that's just too funny. I've got a wife now, so I can't come. Um, well, um, mm, interesting, right? So what are we looking at here? We're looking at possessions. We're looking at, um, uh, we're looking at affection. We're looking at uh, priorities or the lack thereof. I mean, whoever said that the the Ferrari can't wait, right? Whoever said that the wife wouldn't want to come as well and, and would certainly have been welcome? Who would have never said that that the, the field would still be there after the banquet? Do you get the point? This is not about that we have to renounce all of this. This is about coming to the feast now. The emphasis is now. The feast is ready. And that's what this parable is all about. This is what Jesus is trying to say. And he's also pointing out to the Pharisees that the kingdom of God has come now. Stop Stop being focused on your business, gentlemen. Stop being... Uh, uh, um, confused and occupied with the passions in your life, gentlemen. I sit before you as the Messiah of Israel, inviting you into the great banquet feast that you've heard about for all of your life, that our forefathers talked about. Now is the time. And so you see, this is an urgency. Jesus is speaking to these men who are sitting around discussing things and not responding, or they're just too busy to be bothered, or their affection is on their position and they do not like being usurped by this Messiah. They are, there are so many things going on in their heart and Jesus has nailed it just as there are so many things going on in our hearts and Jesus wants us to pay attention. The, he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be yours as well. But when he says come, he means come and he doesn't mean tomorrow, he means now. And that's the point of this, the feast is ready. It, the, the preparations have been made. The strong man that we talked about last week has been bound. Satan no longer can rule this world. Jesus has already taken care of Satan. He has already shown his perfect love for us through his death on the cross. We don't need to wait for another Messiah. We don't need to wait for another message. We don't need to read this book of philosophy. We don't need to go get a PhD in theology to understand this. This is simple. This is about the kingdom of God has come through Jesus, the Messiah. So, um, I, um, I want to show you a couple of things. Oh, well, let me, before I do, um, well, yes, let me show you this. This is a great example of, I showed you the picture, but now let me show you this scripture. This is Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 7. This is speaking, Isaiah the prophet was speaking about the coming uh, of the kingdom. This is 2,000 years before Christ arrived. And he said, in Jerusalem, the Lord of heaven's armies will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world. It will be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged well -aged wine and choice meat. There he will remove the cloud of gloom, the shadow of death that hangs over the earth. He will swallow up death forever. Do you see this? 
Do you hear this? This is 2,000 years before the Messiah arrived. And Isaiah was explaining, it's coming, my friends. And this is what the Messiah will do. And by the way, he did it in Jerusalem in the three years when he was preaching and he will literally invite all of his people and all of his followers into a banquet feast of eternity. So there's an already, this is a theological concept, it's already and not yet. What it means is this prophecy has already been fulfilled and it is not yet fully fulfilled because Jesus is coming, returning a second time. And when he returns the second time, this table that you're looking at or something there like it that will seat millions and millions of people who have responded to the call to the kingdom, who have said yes to the invitation, will sit at the banquet feast with Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah of Israel, and the Messiah of the entire world. And wow, has he done it. Look at this feast. It's going to be the best wine that can be bought. It's going to be the choicest meat that can be bought. The gloom, the cloud of gloom will be gone. The, the shadow of death that hangs over the earth will be swallowed up forever and ever. He will wipe every tear from our eyes. You need, my friends, to catch the vision. That is the vision of our life in eternity. If you love and follow Jesus, Yeshua, you will have a banquet feast forever and ever, and it begins now when you re respond to him and say, yes, I want to go to this banquet feast with Jesus. I say yes. I will not be too occupied with business. I will not be too enamored with my new stuff, my possessions. I will not allow my heart to be stolen by an idol or a person, someone that just just takes all of my love. No, no, and no. My possessions are like, they will rust and fade and fall apart. My cars will run out of gas and rust and fall apart and die. And certainly the people around us, while we love them, they are not to be the center of our affection. Only God only God. If you do not love me, Jesus said, more than your own father and mother and sister and brother and your own children, yes, and then even your own life, you are not worthy of me. You see, we are to take up our cross daily and follow. And that means that we deny ourselves. We deny. It doesn't mean that we can't have anything good. It just means that we can't put those things in front. First place, it must go back, back. If you, my husband used to say about marriage, you know, if there's two on the horse, somebody's got to sit in the front. And I used to say, yeah, well, sometimes it's you and sometimes it's me. Ha ha. Um, but Actually, it's Yeshua who sits on the front, and we are behind him, and that is the way it is. Yeshua, Jesus, our master, the, 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 the Lord of heaven's armies, where do you want to be sitting? You want to sit on the horse behind the Lord of heaven's armies. You want to sit at the table of the banquet feast of eternity, I hope and I pray. And that brings me to a couple of other things. Um, as I read and studied this passage, um, it became increasingly clear that this Jesus, where Jesus was really putting his finger on the pulse of these men was he was recognizing for them and for us that we all have very flimsy excuses for not responding. 
They, those three men that said those things, those were excuses. The truth was they didn't want to go to the feast. And when something better, you know, it's the most, what is that? What's that about the glittering objects? You know, the shiny objects? When the shiny objects came into their focus, I want that and I want that and I want that. So it's not about that, you know, they had these real reasons for not coming. It was these shiny objects that took their heart and they actually did not want to go to begin with. Let me say that again. They actually did not really want to go to begin with. You see, we all do what we want to do all of us. We make a choice. Every, every breath we take, every step we make, we all do what we really want to do. And so these men, and by the way, it's men because Jesus is talking to men, but it's women and men who really don't want to sit at the table of eternity with Jesus, with the Holy Father, with the Spirit. They re they'd rather be away. Um, Dallas Willard, a great, great man of God who's passed away just in the last couple of years, who taught so many wonderful things about soul formation. You can look him up and read his books. I encourage you to, Dallas Willard. He was once asked, um, Dallas, who's going to go to heaven? And his response was, Everybody who wants to. Wow. How hard is that? What a simple answer. What an amazing truth. Everyone who wants to. Now, you may say, well, I want to, but I just don't have the strength to really stay, strong, stay, stay, <laughs> stay resolute in my faith. I'm not like you, Janie. I just... You know, I get tired and I get distracted and, well, you don't really want to go. You really don't want to be close to God because if you really wanted it, you would make efforts to grow your soul. It's just that simple. It's not easy, but it is simple. We all do what we want to do. Do we want to get along with our husband? Work at it. Keep working at it. Do you want to be a better husband? Work at it. Do you want to, to uh, make a difference in this world by the power of God? Work at it. Nothing. Jesus never said anything came easy. It's not easy for me to get online and talk to all of you. May look easy, not easy. But I want to. I want to. I, I get to. And each of you, if it's worth it, you have to put effort into things. If you want to be a great musician, you've got to practice. I mean, this is not rocket science. And it's the same with our souls. We have to make priority, give a practical priority to growing our soul if we desire to become who God wants us to be. And by the way, along the path, we'll also gain skills that we never knew we had because you see, the closer we are to God, the more he shows us who we are in him and gifts rise up, abilities rise up that we didn't know we had. These, these artwork behind me, it may not be great artwork, but I never picked up a paintbrush until about uh, 10 years ago. I never even picked one up. I never tried. I never had, I never had an art class. I never, um, never thought I could do anything with art. <laughs> you see my point? We all have more in us. And if we will stay in step with Yeshua, all the good stuff that he has in us will emerge and we'll go, well, where'd that come from? Well, it certainly wasn't me. Well, it was me, but I didn't know I had it. So many of you have things in you you have no idea, but you're stuck. You're not moving forward. You're not making your soul a priority. You're not saying yes to the kingdom. And so, or maybe you are, but it's one step forward and two steps back. Now you're making progress, but work a little harder. You know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, the scripture said. For God is at work in you to will and to work for his good purpose. 
He also said that we are his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand for us to do. There you are. He prepared it for us to do. It's all there. He's done it. He already sees it. If you'll step in, you'll find it. Go after it, my friends. Go after it. Don't stay stuck. Become more. Become more. Become more. So, I, I, they were excuses. They were excuses. Let me get back to this parable. Let me go, get my head situated again. They were excuses. Now, it says, oh, you like that. I'm glad you like that. So, now, let's look at the response that Jesus said the master was furious, furious that these men had these lame excuses for not coming to the banquet feast. You think God doesn't have a temper? Wrong, he does. He's slow to anger, but he has anger. If we continue to grieve the spirit of God, we will experience the discipline and anger of God and be thankful that he does because if he didn't care so much, he'd just walk away. He wouldn't do what he has to do to get our attention again. So the master was furious and he said to his servant, then go out into the streets and the byways and the highways of life and find the people that are lame and blind and crippled and can't, you know, don't feel worthy of coming to the banquet. Go get those people. And that's what the servant did. He went out and he found as many people. I love it. It even says behind the hedges, you know, people hiding out. Well, actually, it's it's a sad image. It's, it's the homeless. Go after people who need to know they're loved. And friends, let me just say as a side note right there, you think you can't make a difference in the kingdom? Oh, yes, you can. Look around you. The people that don't feel loved, love on them. Let them know that they matter. Do something to show them they matter. Help them if you can help them. Do what you can. There are people all around you. They are the people that need to know about Yeshua, that need to know their love, that need to know they too can be in the kingdom of God. Invite them, invite them, invite them. Be that servant that goes out into the highways and the byways and behind the hedges of life and finds those who need to know. You see, Paul, it's the Apostle Paul said, not many of you were wise, not many of you were had money, not many of you were 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 um, knowledgeable uh, that came into the kingdom. You see, the truth of the matter is, it takes humility to come to the banquet feast. And often, those who think they have everything are too prideful to say yes to the kingdom of God. Hubris, pride, gets in the way. It's, that's the problem. The real reason is we don't want it because of our pride. And my friends, it is foolish pride. It is pride that will, that will <sighs> kill us and destroy us and there will be a time when it'll be too late. There will be a time when the door is shut. Jesus made that clear in other parables. Don't be the one of those standing out in the cold who thought they were too good and too, too smart and too rich to, to, to take the invitation into the kingdom. Don't be one of those who finds themselves pitiful and poor and weak and blind in eternity. Don't be one of those. Put down your pride. Put it down. C.S. Lewis said the greatest sin is pride. Why? Because it blocks everything else. So my friends, um, he goes out into the Bible and then he brings in all of these people into the banquet feast and the master says, well, the table's not full. I want my house to be full. Go find some more and compel them to come in. The word, even though the translation that I copied said, it, um, I, what was it, entice them to come in? The word actually means compel them. That means almost force them. Huh. That means 
Tell them they must come, they must come, they must come. Compel them to come in. There's a seat for you, it's waiting. Compel them with love. Don't compel them with meanness. Compel them with, yes, you're worthy. Come, you're worthy, come. There's a seat with your name on it, come. Persuade people with love. It's love that persuades. <clears throat> it's not, it's not fear that persuades, it's love. Bind them with the cords of love. Tell them they are worthy, they are wanted. You are worthy, my friends, you are wanted. There's a chair at the banquet feast with your name on it. Come, come, come. It is never too late as long as you are on this earth. I want to show you some things, some some slides. You see this hand that, let me see here, here. Oops, it was right side up. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich and buy white garments from me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness, an ointment for your eyes so that you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. Revelation 3, verses 18 through 19. You see, Jesus says, he puts his hand out and he says, come, come, buy from me gold. Well, how do we buy gold? How do we, how do we get raiments? You know, um, there was one of the parables was about the man who didn't have his, or the woman or whoever it was, the person who didn't have their wedding garment on. Well, what is a garment? The garment is the white robe of righteousness that he puts on us to cover our sins. We need to have that garment. That is the humility right there. It's I'm dirty. See, I, 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 without, I'm black underneath, but I need, I need a white robe, the robe of righteousness that only Jesus, Yeshua can give me because he's the one who bound the strong man. He's the one who defeated death on the cross. He's the one who has the white robe for me, the robe of righteousness. I need that. And all you have to do, friends, is say, I want that. I want that, Jesus. I want it. There's darkness in me. I want it. Please give it to me. I don't feel worthy. I'm ashamed of myself. I'm ashamed of my sin. I'm ashamed of my transgressions. Will you please, Jesus, please cover me. Please wash me and I shall be white as snow. That is, that's, that's all we have to do. We just say, Jesus, forgive me. Give me the clothing of righteousness. Cover me. I need it. And he will, and he does, and he washes us, and he gives us this raiment, and he gives us gold, purified by fire. What is gold? The gold, Peter tells us, is our faith. He gives us faith, and he purifies our faith with fire. That's the life on this earth when trials and tribulations happen, that, we, that we're refined in the fire. So, so you have your white garment, and then you have your, your gold in your soul, and, and when we go through, the, through life and we're having trials in this world, we have trouble. We have terrible troubles, but the troubles are used to refine our gold so that we will be all gold and shiny and white and pure. So that's why they, this stuff remains in the world, because we become refined through it. We have a dear friend who is, we, he's actually my son's age. His name is Trevor. I don't mind saying his name, and he's just a delightful young man. And He's been going through some terrible times, and my son just spoke with him and asked him how his faith was doing, and he said, you know, this is just part of the deal. The world has trouble, but I, my faith remains. My faith remains, and he understands the bigger picture. Do you get the bigger picture? Your faith will be refined by fire. Let it be refined. Don't shrink back 
we're told in Hebrews. Do not shrink back. Stay in the fire. Get that refining so that you will be shiny like gold and white and pure. So let me, let me show you a couple of other things um, that I have here. The dangers you need to avoid if you want a seat at the table of the kingdom of God. There's three D's. <sighs> yeah, sorry, it just came to me. <laughs> My husband used to say, I don't know, it just came to me. Well, I say that now too. Dangers to avoid if you want a seat at the table of the kingdom. Are you too distracted? Are you too disobedient? Are you too deceived? Hmm. Are you distracted, my friends? Stop it. Get your mind and your heart back on track. Don't be distracted. Um, thou will, there's a scripture in Isaiah that says, it's Isaiah 26, it says, Thou will be kept in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. Don't be distracted. If you are, get it right, right now. Put your mind and your heart in the peace of Christ. And then you won't be too distracted. You'll have, you can live in this world and live productively in this world and have your mind stayed on Christ. Yes, you can. Are you disobedient? You know what is right to do, but you fail to do it. And that is a great danger because all of us who are Christ followers, have we know a lot of information, but are we doing it? Do not be caught so disobedient that the door shuts in your face. My friends, he loves you. He's speaking to you now. Do not be disobedient. Obedience is not a word in vogue, but it's a word in scripture, and I will not stop using it because I have a choice every day to obey the will of God or not, and so do you. So are you too disobedient? We all disobey, but we all can get our feet back on the way. Do it today. And thirdly, are we too deceived? You know, Eve was deceived in the garden by the snake who whispered lies and she believed the lies. And all of us, if we ignore the word of God, we too will be deceived. Or if we twist it to our own liking, we are deceived. Paul warned us of that danger. And he said, even in his day, thousands of 2,000 years ago, he said, people take the scripture and they twist it. So what, they didn't have the written word, but they had the word that Jesus had spoken. And so there were those who didn't like his words and they would twist them around and preach a different gospel and essentially a different Jesus. Don't be deceived, my friends. There is one Messiah and his words are true. Stick to what we know is true. Don't worry about what we don't know. There's always mystery. Stick to what you know is true and don't be deceived. There are many false prophets in the world. So, um, wow, you see why I had a hard time getting online? You'd think, why? You'd think, well, Janie just should have run online. But the truth was, it's like, how do I say all of this? How do I explain the zeal that's in my soul for each and every one of you to hear, to hear what's being said, to hear, these are the words of Yeshua, not mine. And he spoke and looked into the eyes of these Pharisees, and he told this story about the three who said, well, I've got this, and I've got that and I've got the other thing. And so the master was furious and he sent his servants out and he compelled them to come in. And I compel you, the ser a servant, I too am a servant, compelling you to come in to the kingdom. That fire burns forcefully in my soul that you would know because you are loved, you do not have to stay out in the cold. You don't have to hide in the bushes. You can be in the kingdom today. Today is the day of salvation. My friends, respond today. Yeshua said he extended the invitation and the question I ask all of you is what? 
do you really want? This is where we started and this is where we end. What do you really want? Do you want life here and now? The hand is open. Open yours. His hand is open. Take his hand. If you want him, take his hand. What do you want? If you don't want him, stop playing games. Get off the fence and go live the life you want to live and find out if that's what you really want. Now's the time. If you're going to be disobedient and dis dis deceived and distracted, then go do it. See what that's like. Don't sit on the fence. Decide what you want. This is your opportunity. Maybe you've already been on the other side of the fence and you know what's over there. The, you know the grass looks green, but boy, there's briars over there. Wow, it gets more and more barren over there. Wow, it's hot over there and it's dry over there. But if you don't know that for sure, then go find out. And I mean that with all of my heart. Go find out. Stop dilly-dallying. Get off the fence. Go forward with Jesus or go backwards, but don't sit on the fence. That's what compels me right now. There's an invitation. Take the invitation or don't. Your choice. Your choice. Wherever you are, wherever you live, the whoever, you, whatever you look like, whatever size you are, whatever color you are, it doesn't matter. The invitation is open to all. Take it or don't. And, and keep your eyes open, whichever way you go. Keep your eyes open. Pay attention. Is this working out over here? Well, you might want to turn around. If this isn't working out over here for you, well, fine. Be honest. Go the other way. See if that's better over there. Don't be lukewarm. Revelation 3, I quoted earlier, right before the passage I quoted about the, the, gold, the gold and the raiment is the passage about, I wish that you were either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. That's what I'm saying here. Don't be lukewarm. Be all in. Be all in. Be all in with Jesus or all, in, or all out with Jesus. <laughs> All in or all out, wherever you are, be all there. That's the key to success, whether it's business or spiritual. I hope you choose first to be all in spiritually. Zig Ziglar had to decide to be all in spiritually, and that is when his business started to grow. And I'm not telling you that just so you'll have a prosperous business. I'm telling you that because Mr. Zig Ziglar is gone. He is in eternity. He is sitting at the banquet feast right now, and he's beseeching you as well. Listen, listen, listen. This is where we end up at the banquet feast with Jesus or outside in the cold or in the hot. <laughs> we, won't, we won't go there. You know what I'm saying. Okay, so are you, are you still with me? <laughs> I hope you are. I hope you've heard. I hope you've learned. It is all I can do to express with great love and great fervency the power of the words of God. And these words have echoed through the ages. They are true. They never go out of style. They are never old-fashioned. They are as relevant today as they were when Jesus looked into the eyes of the Pharisees. And now I have looked into your eyes. I have said to you all I know to say, to warn you, to love you, to exhort you, to encourage you, and hopefully to inspire you to take the hand of the man from Galilee. The man from Galilee who left his comfort zone of, of being loved and known and seen and set his face towards Jerusalem where he was hated, reviled, crucified, dead, and buried. But that Jesus rose again on the third day and he stands as the living Christ beseeching you through me to receive the kingdom of God, to come and sit down at the banquet feast. 
And so with that, I will end for today. And I um, want to give him all the glory for great things he has done and will do. And I pray that you, my friends around the world, will step in more deeply into who you are in Christ. You will know who you are and you will discover so many things that you did not know about him and about yourself. Now to him be the glory. All glory to God who is able to keep us from falling away and who will bring us with great joy into his glorious presence. All glory to him who alone is God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, power, authority, and dominion belong to him who was before all time, is in the present, and is forevermore. All glory to God. I love you in Christ. I love you whether you're in Christ or not. And I hope that you'll be back next week. Until then, the Lord willing, have a great week by the power of the Spirit of God. Goodbye.